Luke um, this morning. Our brother and missionary Michael Amati preached last week from Matthew 6, and so we're going to come back to Luke this morning, and we're going to pick up in Luke chapter 10. If you'll remember, the last time we were in Luke, we were looking at three sermons. We gave three sermons out of Luke chapter 9, all about lessons for discipleship. Um, I preached two of those, and Pastor Thad preached one of them. The first one was on knowing Jesus, lessons for discipleship on knowing Jesus, then serving Jesus, and then two weeks ago, Pastor Thad preached for us on following Jesus. And this week, in Luke chapter 10, we're going to continue that theme of following Jesus, thinking about what it actually looks like on the ground to follow him. The last interaction that we saw in the Gospel of Luke, in Luke at the end of Luke chapter 9, Jesus concluded in Luke chapter 9, verse 62, saying, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. So his image here is that the kingdom of heaven is like a, a field that needs to get worked. And that when we enter into service of Jesus and to following Jesus, that we put our hands on a plow and we're working for Jesus. But there's temptation to look back, to go back, to quit, because the work can sometimes get difficult and hard. And so the next three weeks, as we dive into Luke chapter 10, this week we're just going to look at what are the essential components of Christian mission? What, what is it that we're to be about? I mean, if we had to, to summarize it, what does Jesus give us here in the first 16 verses of Luke that describe what our mission is to be as Christians and as a church? So that's this week. We're just going to look at what, what he tells the disciples in his day and what we can learn from that now. But the next two weeks, we're going to, Lord willing, look at motivations to do this. Because it's one thing to know what we ought to do, and it's another thing to have the desire to do it and the desire to stick with it. I think Jesus anticipates, as we just saw in Luke chapter 9, that we'll be tempted to quit, or at least not prioritize the things that Jesus wants us to prioritize if we don't quit altogether. So this week, we're just going to look at the essential components of Christian mission in the first 16 verses of Luke 10, and then, Lord willing, in the next two weeks, we're going we're to mine out several different motivations for us uh, to, to continue pressing on in that mission. That's Luke chapter 10, and that's where we'll be for the next few weeks. So I've got for us this morning, and I've called my sermon Essential Components of Christian Mission, because I think that's what Luke is giving us here in these first 16 verses. And I've got six essential components from the first 16 verses here of Luke chapter 10 of what the Christian mission is to be all about, what we are to be all about in the world as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the first one. The Christian mission is unprofessional. The Christian mission is unprofessional. Look at verse 1 of Luke chapter 10. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. Now, this number, 72, that Luke gives us may appear somewhat inconsequential to us, um, but Luke, I think, has a purpose in mind behind this number and in giving us this information about why Jesus sent 72 of his disciples out. Now, we can't know for sure, but the number 70 or 72 shows up a number of different places in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament. And we know that Jesus is reliving the story of Israel. That's one of his responsibilities as Messiah is to fulfill all, all, the, all the commandments that Israel failed to do. Now, if you remember, back in Genesis chapter 10, there is what we call the table of nations. And in the Hebrew text of Genesis 10, 70 nations are listed in Genesis 10, but in the Greek translation of the Hebrew text that we call the Septuagint, 72 nations are listed. And this is the translation of the Old Testament that Luke is using, um, even as he references Jesus sending out the 72, 72 disciples here. This would have been also the, the Greek translation that Jesus himself might have used or been at least been familiar with. Now, in, the, in this case, the number was intended to signify the nations of the world, that Salvation is not just getting limited to the people of Israel, but now it's going out. And this number 72 is indicating it would have drawn to mind, oh, this has a reference to possibly Genesis 10, the table of nations, that this is a worldwide mission. It's not just limited to the Jews. And of course, we already know that because in Luke chapter 2, we were reminded that Jesus is a light of revelation, not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles, for the nations. And we've seen throughout the Gospel of Luke that Gentiles have been coming into the kingdom of God, not just Jewish people, but those who are outside the Jewish community. 
Now, some say that that might be a little bit of a stretch and that Jesus is not referring to the table of nations in Luke chapter 10 here, but that he is instead referring to the members of Jacob's family who went down from Egypt, and those would have been 70 people. And in that case, this would have symbolized that Jesus is creating a new Israel, that it's not just the people of Israel of that day who were to believe in the Messiah, but anyone who believed in the Messiah would be part of this new Israel that Jesus is forming. And in this case, just as the 12 apostles corresponded to the 12 patriarchs of ancient Israel, then the 70 evangelists would correspond to the 70 original Israelites, showing that Jesus is establishing this new community, this new Israel. Still others say the number refers to the number of elders that Moses had, 70 or 72 in Numbers 11, or even the 70 members of the Sanhedrin, which was kind of the Jewish ruling council, religious council of the day, who provided religious leadership to the Jews. So which is it? Well, whatever the precise connection is, and we can't know for sure, the point is unaffected. We are told that these 72 disciples were sent ahead of him. Did you see that? Verse 1, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him. That phrase, sent on ahead, is literally, were sent before his face. Now, that may not make any significant impact on you, but this is the same language that is used of John the Baptist in Luke chapter 1, verse 76, that he was preparing the way that he was sent before the face of the Lord. Now, what's my point? These 72 disciples are receiving the same commission that the original 12 received in, in Luke chapter 9 and that John the Baptist received in Luke chapter 1. It hasn't changed. The mission is the same. Now, what's the significance of that? The significance of it is hard to overstate because Jesus is telling us that ordinary disciples are called to do the things that Jesus commanded the apostles to do and that he commanded John the Baptist to do. Now, surely, it'll take different forms, but the commission of proclaiming the kingdom of God is given to all of Jesus' disciples, not just those who were the 12 or even special disciples like John the Baptist. This is why I say the Christian mission is unprofessional. Everyone has a role to play in advancing Christ's cause, and Christ's cause is to be extended everywhere. The work of the Christian mission isn't limited to the professionals, to the apostles, to the pastors, to the deacons. It's for all who claim to know Christ. We are all called to share the gospel, to love others in word and deed, and place the mission of Christ at the center of our lives. So, dear ones, do we view, do you view yourself as one who has personal responsibility for the mission of Christ? Like, you're not on the sidelines, you're in the game, you are called to be in the game. We are called to be disciple making disciples of Jesus and not to outsource that responsibility to the professionals. We are all called to this work of making more and better Christians, wherever God has placed us, in our families, in our workplaces, neighborhoods, fr among our friends. We, we are all called to be concerned and give ourselves to the mission of Christ in that way. So that's the first component. The Christian mission is unprofessional. And in that sense, it's democratized among God's people. But that doesn't mean that everybody's on board with it. Because secondly, the Christian mission is prayerful. The Christian mission is unprofessional first, but secondly, the Christian mission is prayerful. Look at verse 2. And he said to them, to the 72 that, he just, that he's sending, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The Christian mission is prayerful. The first great work of Christian mission is done in prayer. So naive, isn't it? I say that sarcastically. I mean, we're just supposed to ask God to reverse the trend. We just need some more money, don't we? More strategy. 
some ingenuity, some entrepreneurial skill, and we can make it happen. We just need the right people in the right seats on the bus. Now, I'm saying that somewhat sarcastically, and there are things that we can learn from the secular world and, and business theory and all that, but that's not the wheel that steals the, steers the church, nor is it the engine that fuels the mission. Our sinful hearts and our can-do culture continually counsel us that we can do whatever we set our minds to do. If you can dream it, you can do it, says the quote. But dear ones, that's not the way it is in the kingdom of God. We can dream it. We can't do it in and of ourselves. The Christian mission has a labor shortage, and it has nothing to do with efforts at recruitment. If you look at the church in America, we are facing a pulpit pandemic in the years to come. There are not enough laborers to fill those who are retiring. Every denomination knows it, and everybody's trying to come up with a solution for it, and Jesus has already given it here. It's not a unique problem. There's always a labor shortage in the kingdom. It's not like our generation is particularly unique with all of its rampant secularism. No, it was in first century Jew, Jewish culture too. Nobody was wanting to sign up for the mission of God. And so, this is not a new problem. But according to Luke, it's always a problem. And according to Jesus, whom Luke is quoting, it's always a problem because the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The problem is not that there's no harvest. The problem is that there are too few laborers, too few Christians doing the work of the Christian mission. Amen. So how does Jesus tell us that this problem is going to be solved? How, how do we address this labor shortage? We pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. Do we really believe that? Do we really believe that? If we do, it will show up in our lives, and it will show up in the time that we devote to prayer as a church. He told us, Jesus tells us here, that the harvest of disciples is plentiful, but the number of laborers is few, so we are to pray earnestly, begging God, to send out workers into his harvest field. Are we praying for laborers to go into the harvest? Is that a standard prayer? Is that a regular prayer? Dear ones, if you're looking at the news or reading your social media feed and you're discouraged by the plight of the American church or the American culture and you're not regularly praying that the Lord would raise up workers and send them into his harvest, you are not addressing the problem. You can gr 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 gripe and groan and all that stuff about it, but until we start praying, Lord, please send laborers into your harvest and make me one. We're not doing what Jesus would call us to do in responding to the challenges of our moment. It should be something that's very, very important to us as God's people to pray that the Lord would continually raise up and send workers into his harvest. Listen, you know this. We live in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. The last days are occupied with such things, and this is not something education or politics or morality or the justice system can fix. It's something prayer fixes. And I know that gets a lot of knocks. I'm not saying prayer is the only thing we do, but prayer must be the first thing we do. It must be the main thing we do. And if we believe that, we'll pray individually, as families, and as a church. And we'll come to prayer meetings, and we'll pray for those things. And we'll ask the Lord to answer those things in accordance with His will. Dear ones, do we really believe that prayer is the most, not only, but most essential and powerful means of helping forward the cause of Christ in the world? Our flesh won't tell us that. The world won't tell us that. But Christ tells us that, and I think he knows a thing or two about building his kingdom. And he tells us, you want to build my kingdom? Ask me to do it. Ask me to raise up workers. Ask me to send them out, because that's the only way they're going to go, is if I do it. 
And so the way we will build the church is by praying for more laborers to go into the harvest. That's not where the mission stops, but it's most certainly where the mission begins. So that's our first two. Christian mission is unprofessional, and the Christian mission is prayerful. Thirdly, the Christian mission is fearful. The Christian mission is fearful. Notice verse 3. This is one of the reasons we have to pray. Go your way, Jesus says. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Now, it doesn't take any familiarity with the animal kingdom to understand that you got a vulnerable animal with a predator. And we're not the wolves. We're the lambs who are being sent out in the midst of wolves. The image is stressing that Jesus is sending his disciples into dangerous territory. Christians are sent as lambs, meek, weak, in the midst of wolves who are eager to eat lambs. Jesus is giving us a gracious heads up. He's saying if you sign up for the Christian mission, you're signing up for a fearful mission. This is what you can expect when you engage the world with the gospel. Now, it was a strong but true saying of Martin Luther who said that Cain will murder Abel, if he can, to the end of the world. The seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent, will always be at war. And this is the way it plays out. Do not be astonished, says John, if the world hates you. It hated Christ first. And as we saw on the screen after the video, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And that includes 21st century America as well. Now, Jesus says the reason it's fearful is because we'll get, we, we're not sure what kind of response we're going to receive from the people that we try to engage and share the good news of Jesus with. Some to whom we preach will be receptive, praise the Lord. We see this in verse 8 where Jesus says, whenever you enter a town and they receive you. That's good news. It's always nice to be welcomed for the message that you're come to bring. There will be some who receive the message and the messenger. That's great. But it won't always be that way. There will be others to whom the message will be rejected or by whom the message will be rejected. Jesus says in verse 10, but whenever you enter town, enter a town and they do not receive you. So there will be those who receive us and there will be those who don't receive us. But notice what Luke says in verse 11. This is a very important verse. Look at verse 11. Jesus says, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. So that's a sign of prophetic judgment against those who didn't receive the message of the Messiah and his kingdom. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. Wait. I understand that the kingdom of God has come near when people receive the message of the kingdom and enter it. But Jesus says here that the kingdom of God has come near not just when people receive it, but when they reject it. More on that a little bit later in the sermon. That's a really important point. Don't think that the kingdom of God is not come near to someone who rejects the kingdom. It has come near to them, and they've rejected it. Because when the gospel message gets presented to somebody, the kingdom of God has come near to them. They have the opportunity to enter the kingdom, and they've rejected it. And that bears serious consequences, which we'll get, with, get to as we, as we move along here. So Jesus makes clear there are going to be two responses. Those responses are summarized in verse 16, where we read, The one who hears you, there's the first response, hears me, or receives you. The one who rejects you, rejects me. There's the two responses. Hearing and receiving, hearing and rejecting. But notice what Jesus says about those who reject us, who reject you, who reject the 72 here that Jesus sent in Luke chapter 10. He says, the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. So if they reject you, they're rejecting me. And if they reject me, they reject the Father. That's an amazing statement. 
Christ tells the 72 that those who rejected their message rejected Jesus, and in so doing, rejected the one who had sent Jesus, namely God the Father. So in addition to conveying the terrible consequences of refusing to believe the gospel, this saying provides some encouragement for believers to persevere in telling other people about Jesus. Now, this is a weird encouragement, but it's an encouragement. Why do I say it's an encouragement? Because when you are faithful to present the gospel and people hate you for it, it's not you. It's not you. It's the one you represent. That's strangely encouraging, isn't it? Now, we have a tendency to take things like that personally, but Jesus is saying in verse 16, don't take it personally. It has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with me. And it has everything to do with my Father who sent me. Now, for sure, we live in an online world where many people cry martyrdom who are jerks for Jesus. You've seen this, right? They're offensive. They're unloving. They're not gentle. They're not patient. They don't treat other people like image bearers. But if somebody speaks against them, they're speaking against Christ in them. No, they're not. They're having a fleshly response to your flesh. So there's a difference. So we're not talking about legitimate personal rejection by being obnoxious or condescending or otherwise ill-mannered. We're talking about when we are meek like lambs, that's what we're called to be, meek and weak, presenting the gospel out of vulnerability and weakness and a desire to do good to others, and they reject us, Jesus says, that rejection is not a personal rejection. In the sense it's not personal against you, it's personal against me. And that should help lessen the hesitation we may feel to proclaim, quiet, proclaim Christ because we fear being rejected. You're not the one getting rejected. Christ is the one getting rejected. But notice what Luke 10, 16 says also. It says, the one who hears you hears me, the one who rejects you rejects me, and the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. Now, this is a very controversial statement, I think, in our day. Because what it's saying is if we are rightly representing Jesus Christ in our message and our manner, and we are rejected for that, people are rejecting Jesus not just us. Now, I think that has a hu huge implications on the authority of the church. Now, why do I say that? No doubt, the church has and continues in some circles to abuse its authority by telling people to do things that Jesus never told them to do. Maybe it's what the pastor wants them to do. Maybe it's what some Christian wants them to do. But it's not what Jesus wanted them to do. And I'm talking about specifically in the scriptures, told by Jesus, you do this. So I'm not talking about that. That's an abuse of authority. I'm talking about legitimate authority that God has put in his word where Christians tell other Christians, you've got to live this way if you're going to claim to be a Christian. Not because I said it, but because Jesus said it. And I love you, and I want you to follow Jesus. And Jesus says if they reject that, they're rejecting Christ. Which is why church discipline is so fearful. Because it's the group of people, the congregation, saying, you are not following Jesus. We are speaking on behalf of Jesus that you're no longer an evident follower of him. And as a result, Jesus amends that. That's very controversial, but that's what Jesus teaches here. And I, and I make the qualifier. As long as we are accurately reflecting Jesus in our message and manner, that's the case. That's the case. Ecclesiastical authorities can't bind the conscience where God has left it free or impose rules as requirements for salvation on God's people that God has not given. But where we rightly speak and apply the scriptures, disobeying them means we disobey Christ because it is his word and it's Christ himself that we're rejecting when we do such things. That is a lot of theology right there in that little verse about how Jesus relates to us in terms of 
what happens when people reject the message of Christ presented by the church and what Jesus says about that. He says, they're rejecting me. So there's lots to think about there in terms of our Christian mission and how we, how we faithfully represent Christ. Number four, we've looked at the Christian mission being unprofessional, prayerful, fearful, fourthly, critical. The Christian mission is critical. I just mean by critical, urgent, necessary, urgent. Now, many of the instructions that Jesus gives here at the beginning of Luke chapter 10 to the 72 are identical to the instructions that he gave to his apostles in Luke chapter 9. Would you notice that with me real fast? Turn back just one chapter to Luke chapter 9, the first six verses. Remember when he sent out his 12 apostles first? And what did he give them authority to do? Notice what he says in verse 3 of Luke chapter 9. He said to them, Take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor money, nor bread. Do not have two tunics, and whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. Whenever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. That sounds very similar to what he says to the 72 here in Luke 10, doesn't it? It is. It's exactly the same. Look back at Luke chapter 10. Look at verse 4. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. So he says, don't take anything with you. Go to houses. If they welcome you in, share the gospel. If they don't, shake the dust off your feet and leave them. He says the same thing to the 72 as he does to the 12. Now that's another evidence that the mission is unprofessional. But I think there's something else being communicated by this behavior. And that's that the mission is critical. Now, why do I say that? What is this reason that Jesus gives for not taking anything with you? He says in verse 4, don't carry a tunic or a money bag or a knapsack or sandals. And I think he means by that like extra sandals. I'm sure they're not walking barefoot, although they might be. But why, don't take anything. And then he says this thing, greet no one on the road, verse 4. So you're supposed to be rude? Walk, don't say hi to people. Now, there's certain parts of the world. I've been to Serbia. You don't make eye contact and you don't say hi on the road. But here, if you're walking past somebody and you don't make eye contact and don't say hi, it's like, who does that person think they are? You know, it's kind of offensive. But what's Jesus trying to communicate here? Is he just trying to say, look, trust me. I'll take care of you. Well, that's part of it. But there's something about this urgency. Go. Don't, don't, don't try to collect all your gatherings now. Just do it. Go Get out there. Go house to house. Share this message. Here's what David Gooding, a commentator, gives as a possible reason for why the disciples are to present themselves this way as like these poor, destitute, homeless people. Don't have an extra tunic, don't have a knapsack, just showing up, no second pair of sandals, just knocking on the door. Why, why that? Here's what David Gooding says. He says, they were to carry no cash, spare clothes or provisions. The effect would be to force the townspeople to a decision as to what they should do with them. If the people were faced with penniless, destitute men claiming to be Messiah's own ambassadors... They would be forced to decide whether they're going to receive them and entertain them or reject them. Maybe that's the reason. I don't know if Gooding's right on that. But the point is, is that by showing up on the doorsteps of these people looking penniless and destitute, it would create a situation where are you going to take care of them or not? Are you going to, especially because they're saying I'm representing Messiah. So we're told that these disciples were not to move from house to house but if a house received them, they were to stay there. Now, besides giving an opportunity to provide the people who were living in that house more access to gospel instruction, this practice would show something even more significant. And that is that the 72 disciples who were sent out were honest and they were not trying to extort money from people. The 72 were to be content with what one house could provide for them. They weren't to go house to house based on what kind of digs they could get. Hey, I, I enjoyed being with you all these last couple of days, but that floor is getting really tired of sleeping on. I met this lady in town at the market. She's got a bed. We're going to go stay there tonight. Well, what, that, what would that communicate? I care about convenience more than Christ. And that's not the message that Jesus wants communicated by his disciples. 
He didn't want them rolling up in a gold-plated chariot and getting out and advertising the gospel of the kingdom. Who's your Messiah? Oh, that penniless rabbi in Galilee. Huh? Why are you living high on the hog? So that's the, that's the demeanor that Jesus is trying to ward off. He's trying to force the townspeople into a decision, but also he's trying to represent the ethics of his kingdom. If these disciples go around lobbying to find the best table in the community, not only are they insulting their original host, but they're clearly showing that their convenience matters a whole lot more to them than their Christ. And that's not the message Jesus once communicated. And this, dear ones, is why we as God's people must be concerned about such things. Here's what J.C. Ryle says about the need to embrace this kind of mindset. Even though it doesn't mean you can't buy two pairs of shoes, doesn't mean you can't carry a purse, ladies, if you're going to be on mission for Jesus. This is a specific task given to a specific group of 72, but I'm trying to mine out a principle here. And here's what J.C. Ryle says is the principle, and I agree with him. They were to abstain even from the appearance of covetousness or love of money or luxury. They were to behave like men who had no time to waste on the empty compliments and conventional courtesies of the world. These words of our Lord teach us to prepare, beware of allowing the world to eat up our time and thoughts and to hinder us in our spiritual work. They teach us that care about money and excessive attention to what are called the courtesies of life are mighty snares in the way of Christ's laborers and snares into which they must take heed lest they fall. Let us consider these things. They concern ministers especially, but they concern all Christians more or less. Let us strive to show the men of the world that we have no time for their mode of living. Let us show them that we find life too precious to be spent in perpetual feasting and visiting and calling and the like, as if there were no death or judgment or life to come. By all means, let us be courteous, but let us not make the courtesies of life into an idol before which everything else must bow down. Let us declare plainly that we seek a country beyond the grave and that we have no time for that incessant round of eating and drinking and dressing and civility and exchange of compliments in which so many try to find their happiness, but evidently try in vain. Let our principle be that of Nehemiah. I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Nehemiah 6.3. These words, Ryle says, ought to remind us of the necessity of simplicity and unworldliness in our daily life. We must beware of thinking too much about our meals and our furniture and our houses and all those many things which concern the life of the body. We must strive to live like men and women and children whose first thoughts are about the immortal soul. We must endeavor to pass through the world like men and women and children who are not yet at home and are not overly troubled about the fare they meet with on the road and at the end. Blessed are those who feel like pilgrims and strangers in this life and whose best things are all to come. I know that's a long quote, but I think we could use a little bit more of that kind of lifestyle in our Christianity. A little bit more of that urgency. For the 72 and for us today, the Christian mission is critical. It's urgent. While these instructions aren't meant to be a step-by-step -step manual for Christian mission, as many of the directions concern, like I said, a specific place and a specific time, Nevertheless, the urgency communicated here is surely for us. We don't have to be vocational missionaries to live this way. We're just called to be Christians. The gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. And so there is an urgency to the gospel. There is a critical nature to the gospel. We must pray. We must proclaim the good news. We must make disciples. And we've got to be willing to prioritize it. And that means we won't give as much attention to the luxuries and conveniences of this life as we might otherwise give. Now, that doesn't mean don't go shopping. doesn't mean don't eat. It just means what are we prioritizing in terms of what eats up the bulk of our mental space, attention, and time? And if it's not these sorts of things, we need to re we repent and recalibrate to what the mission really is all about. Two more very quickly. Number five, the Christian mission is verbal. The Christian mission is verbal. Jesus says in verse 9, heal the sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. He says again, over and over in this text, if you look at chapter 10, whatever, you, whenever you, whatever house you enter, verse 5, first say, peace to this house and remain in that same place. Verse 8, whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Verse 9, say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. So, 
We are to say things. The kingdom of God is verbal. Now, it's more than verbal. Jesus also describes you're to show compassion to people, specifically to these 72. They were given power to heal. We don't have that same power as they had back then, but we can certainly care about people's physical illness, and we can pray to the one who can heal them. And we should pray, pray for that, and we should care about people in their physical struggles. But Jesus says we have a message to proclaim, and the message that the 72 brought consisted of a declaration of the nearness of the kingdom of God. Now, why was the kingdom of God near? Messiah was there. Messiah is living on the earth right now. Essentially, these disciples were to announce the same message that we announce. What's that message? Announce that God, with whom we are at war because of sin, suffered in our place in the person of Jesus Christ and offers us peace and reconciliation through faith in his king, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's offering amnesty. He's offering peace and freedom and liberty. He's offering forgiveness. The gospel is God's offer of peace with him to sinners who receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. And this faith that's expressed in Christ alone is the only way to have peace with God. It's the same message that they proclaimed. It's the same message that we proclaim today. Have you received that message? Has everyone in this room been brought to a place where they've recognized that they need peace with God. That the, the, the no amount of works that they do or efforts that they try or reform things that they try to do to clean up and help their life can ever bring them peace with God. It's only through receiving the peace that God has offered to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this verbal component of Christian mission of declaring and proclaiming the kingdom of God has been clearly on display in Luke. It's what Jesus did in chapter 4. It's what John the Baptist did in chapter 1. It's what the angels did in chapter 2. It's what the apostles did in chapter 9. And it's what the disciples are called to do here in chapter 10. Preach, preach, say, say, proclaim, proclaim, tell, tell this good news of what Jesus has come to do. Sixthly and finally, the Christian mission is consequential. The Christian mission is consequential. The 72 were not only to tell the people what the kingdom of God was all about, that it had come near and what the terms of the kingdom of entering it were, but they were also to tell people of the consequences if they refuse God's gracious offer of peace through Jesus. And I want to tell us those consequences this morning as well. Those who do not receive Christ remain in conflict with the Creator, and according to Jesus, it will be worse for them at the judgment than it was for Sodom and Gomorrah. Look at verse 12. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. He's talking about the town that rejects the Messiah, that does not receive Jesus, that does not, is not interested in entering his kingdom or learning more about it. The cities of Sodom, Tyre, Sidon, Gomorrah are known in Scripture as some of the most wicked cities in the Old Testament. Sodom was a town of sexual perversion. Tyre and Sidon were known to oppress Israel, and they received prophetic condemnation from many of the Old Testament prophets, especially Ezekiel. Read Ezekiel 26 to 28 if you want to hear some sizzling prophetic judgment on those towns. And yet, Jesus says to the modern cities of that day, Verse 13, woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sinning in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you, and you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. Jesus were here, he might say, woe to you, Owensboro. You have been filled with gospel preaching churches for, for decades now. It will be more tolerable for Iran on the day of judgment than you. And they're full of terrorists. And you're full of people who rejected the gospel. That's what he would say. Wouldn't he? Absolutely. These people had no access to the gospel. They lived like the world for the world. These people heard the gospel over and over and over again. Didn't change them one bit. That's scary. That's terrifying. 
man, some people are going to get a wake-up call in judgment. I hope it's not me. hope it's not us. Jesus used these cities to make a point about the sin of the people who witnessed our Lord's earthly ministry but did not respond in faith and repentance. He pronounced woes on Chorazin and Bethsaida, two towns in Galilee where Jesus would have spent a large percentage of his time and observed that if Tyre and Sidon, these wicked Old Testament cities, had seen the miracles and ministries of Jesus, they would have already repented a long time ago. Jesus was contrasting the hard-heartedness of the Galileans with the hard-heartedness of the famously evil citizens of places like Tyre and Sidon. The Galilean Jews had prided themselves on their righteousness, but they had a false estimation of themselves. And if they truly had hearts to follow of God, follow God, they would have responded favorably to the Christ when he came among them. But Tyre and Sidon, despite their wickedness, were not so set against God that they would have been unable, Jesus says, to see my work and not be moved to faith and repentance. Jesus then said to Capernaum, another Galilean town would face judgment for denying him. Now what's the point? What's the point? The Christian mission is consequential. Specifically, the more light that we've been given regarding the things of God the more information that we have been given about the kingdom of God, the more liable we are for our response to that revelation. As wicked and as guilty and as deserving of punishment as Sodom was, the greater sin belonged to Chorazin and Bethsaida, for they had seen and heard our Lord himself and had refused him. And for their abuse of such great light and privilege, their judgment will be the more severe." Because the Galilean Jews had received a crystal clear revelation of the Lord's salvation, their guilt for rejecting him was far, far greater than the guilt of the enemies of Israel's Israel who had no such revelation given to them. This is deeply disturbing. The person who grows up in a society in which the gospel is readily available and the person who grows up in a Christian home have great light and privilege The person who attends a gospel-preaching church has great light and privilege. The person who has a Christian friend who witnesses to them has great light and privilege. And for this light and for this privilege, God will hold us accountable to how we respond to it, if it has any impact on us whatsoever. And the less it has an impact, the greater the judgment. I don't say that with any delight. I say that with fear for some of us. But here's the good news. What if God were to use this very warning to bring you to Christ? Wouldn't that be the kind of the purpose of the sermon like this? Because guess what? Everyone who sat in here, whether you're a kid or whether you're an adult who's not yet professed faith in Christ and followed him, you've heard the gospel hundreds and hundreds of times, you've not responded, guess what? You haven't died yet and you're hearing it again. What if this time you said, what am I waiting for? And you called upon the Lord Jesus Christ before you got out of your chair this morning. And you said, Lord, save me from my sin and forgive me for being more wicked than Sodom. And he will delightfully forgive you. And he will readily and eagerly receive you. Because he just told you, Son, daughter, I love you. I don't want you to run out into the road and get hit by a car. That's why I'm telling you this morning. Don't go any further. Yield now. Because if this privilege is refused, and it is a privilege to have access to the gospel, to have the king speak to you daily, it's a privilege And to have that refused, judgment will be unspeakably horrific. For those who have heard the gospel, only finally to refuse it, the the gospel that's preached will in the end have served only to increase the guilt that we bear and the punishment that we receive. But only for those who won't receive Christ as he's freely offered in the gospel, which he's offered again this morning. 
And don't let the devil sneak in and say, just keep resisting. You've resisted so far, you might as well keep going. Don't you see that's what he wants you to do? That's an old play. Don't listen to him. He's taken you captive to do his will, and the main way he takes you captive is by blinding your eyes from seeing the glory of Christ. And Christ is being presented for you as the one who says, I'll take Sodom for you. I'll take Tyre for you. I'll take Sidon for you. I'll bear all your judgment on me. I'll suffer in your place. You don't have to go there. You don't have to do that. I'll take you. You're not too dirty for me. Have you seen Luke's gospel so far? There's some dirty folks who come to Jesus. Jesus says, I don't care about your past. I want to give you my future. I want to give you my present, my, my position, not as God, but as one who is a son, lowercase s, daughter of God, one who has inherited everything that I will inherit. And I pray that if you haven't received that yet, you'd receive him today, even right now. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word, both its sober warnings and its precious promises. Lord, these are some sober words from Jesus this morning about judgment that is to come for those who hear of the kingdom but don't respond to it. But Lord, we thank you that that's not the only story that's being presented here. That's not the only truth that's being communicated because there are those who do receive. There are many who receive, who recognize Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of the living God. He is worthy of knowing and serving and following. He is who He says He is. And so, Lord, may You convince and convict and draw lovingly and sweetly any of those who are among us who have yet to say, I'm in. I'm in. I want Jesus Christ. I want to belong to His kingdom. I want to follow Him. I want to know Him. I want to serve Him. Not out of just fear of judgment, but because he is a great and gracious Savior. And his mission is worthy of giving my life to. His mission is an eternal mission. His mission is something that fills life with meaning and significance and purpose. And it's, and it's attached to things that will last long into eternity after all the harvest has been gathered. Lord, make us all to be laborers in your harvest. We pray that you would do that for us, that we would be among those who are earnestly serving, knowing, and following you wherever you have placed us, seeking to make the gospel known and make more and better Christians through our lives and our witness. We ask all this for the glory of Jesus Christ in his name. Amen. Let's stand, brothers and sisters, and sing.